Hey, hey friends, this is end of day 24 of Russian war against Ukraine. Over the weekend we have been seeing very little action, but more of a speculation of what's going to happen next. As, we're, as we know, Russia is in a tough spot because their resources are running out, their troops, their machinery, their ammo, and they're trying to figure out what, what, what we're going to do after this. We've seen that in their inability to do anything, they have been bombarding and trying to level the city of Mariupol off the ground. 80 or 90 percent, 80 to 90 percent of this city had been already leveled. People are, are trying to escape. Once, once in a while, they would set up a green corridor and uh, and let either buses of people or people people with their personal vehicles uh, trying to get out. There is some horror stories I'm sure you've heard from from the city of Mariupol and and what's going on there. It's a real, really humanitarian crisis. There's bodies on the street uh, with no ability to bury them because it's the, the city is being bombarded. People have to drink water, like from either the rain or melting the snow. It it is unthinkable of what you would think would never happen in in century 21. But yet here we are. So unfortunately, that that is happening. But that's from Russia's inability. Uh, and, and weakness to do anything about anything uh, the rest of Ukraine. So now the big question is, what is the Russia's next big move is going to be? And there is we have some indication of what's going to happen. Finally, our uh, the head of our intelligence uh, c committee had did, that did a briefing on Sunday talking about the, the, what they're seeing uh, and the information that they are able to recover. So the big thing right now is Belarus. So Belarus has been on the brink, on the fence about going into war or not for for the last maybe 10 days, two weeks. Putin is trying to get their president Lukashenko, who's also a dictator, into the war. He doesn't want to because he understands it's a big danger to, to his rulership because once uh, the army is deployed, they can actually go back and, and try to depose him. But now, on the other hand, he has Putin, who's also uh, threatening to depose Lukashenko because um, because he has that power, because he's sponsoring Lukashenko and his regime. So if the money stops flowing, then Lukashenko will not have any leverage over his, over his special forces who enforce his dictatorship in Belarus. Belarus has been... Uh, has been interesting because we see uh, that most of the population, in fact, by a recent assessment, as much as 97% of the population are against Rus uh, Belarusian troops going into Ukraine. So they have been trying to sabotage uh, all, uh, sabotage this operation in all kinds of ways. We, we hear stories about guerrillas trying to disable uh, disable the railroad, uh, different points, trans transformers along the along the railroad. They're throwing a wire across the two rails in order to send send a false signal that something something had bro broken down down the line. So I have to stop all the trains and go check it out. So much so that they, that Belarusian president had had started to send out special enforcement groups to try and flush out the guerrillas. They're going door to door, arresting people. And if they cannot find anything uh, that would that would make them think that this is a, a guerrilla operation, they would um, still punish people with some administrative punishments. So they're really cracking down on their own population uh, because they're, they're trying to stop Belarusian invasion into Ukraine. Uh, we know that a, a lot of uh, the troops are not willing to fight either. They're, uh, th this is a hearsay, but uh, a lot of them would have plans to go into, go into Ukraine, hide in the trench for a little bit, and then give up uh, in order not, not to have to fight. Uh, we're, we're also seeing uh, that uh, a lot of Belarusian soldiers, uh, well, young people are trying to avoid conscription by getting sick or leaving the country on, on important business and stuff like that. So there's all kinds of things going on. Bel Belarus, as far as population, does not want to get involved. Lukashenko doesn't want to get involved, but there is, uh, but there is uh, some big leverage points that, that Putin can use against Lukashenko. For example, Lukashenko's oldest son is, is in Moscow and, and Russia is using him as as to blackmail uh, blackmail Lukashenko. We're seeing that um, uh, because of the financial leverage that Putin has over him, and more so, Russian troops are in Belarus as well. So this means that if Lukashenko decides to back down, there is Russian troops already on his soil, ready to be activated. So they're in a tough spot, and our intelligence is saying that they are actually moving moving closer to the border and are forming into uh into 
special battle position, so that tells us that the invasion is imminent. The big question is, what's going to happen when the order is given? Are they going to try and be aggressive and, and push towards Ukraine? Uh, or are they going to uh, try to be passive and, and give up? We don't know. Uh, Ukrainian propaganda is actually trying to message to them that if you if you guys give up, if you turn over the, your machinery and weapons, we're going to treat you with dignity, and and when this is over, you you can go back home, which is I think is a is is a smart move. Also, what's funny is that when the the, the spot they're they're trying to invade from Belarus, um, that that area of Ukraine is called Volyn, and Volyn is a is is Western Ukraine, which is known for its spirit spirit of freedom of people. They're not even letting Ukrainian government tell them what to do. So uh, something that Belarus government might not know is that this is, this is a very tough spot to fight. And some of our Ukrainian military experts are even saying that we might not need the army there because people are armed and, and people are going to put up such a resistance that nothing's going to happen there. But hopefully, um, hopefully the Belarusian army is not going to fight and, and, and give up and that will make things easier for everyone and obviously, obviously for Ukraine. So that's Belarus is, is something we're watching. That's number one. Number two is that we're seeing that uh, Russia is starting to trace out their plan for what their next moves are. Uh, we're seeing that new machinery is being supplied to the Belarusian border. So it's not really a Belarusian army. It's, it's a hybrid of, of Russian machinery, some Russian troops and Belarusian army. Um, th there's a group within Russia called Conflict Intelligence Group, and they uh, they are researching everything that's happening on the field. And the way they do this is they gather all the videos, all the images that we have, and they by the, by images very scrupulously tracking like this piece of machinery, what happened to it, th th this person, we now see them dead. Uh, what does their documentation say? Where do we trace them back to Russia and stuff like that? So they're really meticulous about how they go about the research. So from them, we know that new machinery is, be is being pulled in and, and Russia is trying to conscript about 20,000 of their own young people to go into uh, in, into Ukraine. Uh, another thing we're seeing uh, on, on the Russian front and they're preparing for the second wave is that uh, they are utilizing a uh, an organization for young people called Unarmia and basically it's a it's an anagram uh, of two words uh, Un which, which means uh, young young army so basically this is like a children's and teenager organization with which they're trying now to um, activate to go into Ukraine. So our people, our experts are saying that they might use people who had not reached um, 21 years or, or even 18 years old to, to go into war. They're literally sending children to war. Also, the, this organization resembles uh, a uh, infamous Hitler Jungen uh, program, Hitler Youth, uh, basically the same thing. It's, it's uncanny how self unaware Russia is about doing this, this stuff. Uh, we're also uh, the same, uh, actually not not conflict intelligence group, uh, but uh, Ukrainian ministry, Ukrainian agency for uh, for intelligence is saying that there are several special force groups that are sent into Ukraine to take out the heads of government, which would be Zelensky himself, his prime minister, uh, the minister of defense, but uh, they're saying that. This, this is not going to happen. This has already happened several times and, and uh, Zelensky had known about the injury to, him, to himself personally and to his cabinet, sorry, to his to his government, but then that, that not has happened. So even though that is happening, nobody's losing sleep over that one. Um, Russia is trying to um, recruit fighters from Lebanon. So Khalif Haftar visited Moscow over the weekend. And although we, of course, don't know what Hemant Putin talked about, but the speculation is, and I think this is this is pretty credible and and quite plausible, is that they're gonna uh, they're gonna try to um, hire fighters from Lebanon because we know Syrian fighters had said no uh, because they didn't like the logistics, they didn't not, not like what they were gonna pay, and they were gonna be paid in rubles. So now they're talking about Lebanon. 
Um, and it also also looks like by by how Russian television is is changing their messaging, it looks like they're preparing Russia for a long drawn out war. So why is that? Well, why is that happening? Because as we know, it's not in Russia's interest to draw out uh, to to have a prolonged conflict because when the vegetation starts to kick in, uh, Ukraine is going to have a significant uh, leg up. And we're seeing here that Russia is trying to, besides uh, trying to throw everything they have at, at Ukraine, you know, Belarus, Lebanon, Hitler, Jungen, whatever, but they're also trying to um, message around peace talks, saying that, well, Ukraine is protracting peace talks, we are actually ready. Uh, ready to make a peace deal, but their demands are not reasonable at all. So th they're still saying that uh, they're still saying that uh, one requirement that's not going to go away is is demilitarization of Ukraine. So demilitarization basically means that Russia gets a say in how many troops Ukraine can hold, what kind of weaponry uh, we can use. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the specifics about how Russian army operates, sorry, how a Ukrainian army operates, which means that they're trying to um, level Mariupol. They're trying to take Kharkiv uh, and and Kiev. They have forgotten about that idea. Nothing is really happening in Kiev in terms of what, what has been happening two weeks ago. But they're trying to uh, take those two cities. So when they come to the negotiating table, they have some chips to bargain, but also through. Uh, through concessions on the Ukrainian side, basically take over Ukraine, uh, even militarily, but over time. So we see their tactic is changing from a blitzkrieg to something something uh, drawn out, where Ukraine agrees to some of the crazy conditions and say, yeah, well, we're going to let you uh, let you have a say in what kind of army, how many, how much army, how what kind of ammunition, what kind of machinery, uh, and, and weapons we're allowed to have. So it looks like the, the, this is the. Uh, the path that Putin is trying to take, uh, but uh, thankfully our President Zelensky is is being strong. He's saying that nothing of that of that sort, no, nothing of those demands are going to be met. This is this is not negotiable on the Ukrainian side, and we'll keep fighting. So um, props to him on that. Um, we're seeing that Putin's rhetoric is trying to is is uh, is changing. He's starting to use more and more of a rhetoric that this is a world war um, because he cannot. It, it's a hit to his uh, pride that uh, he, he was stopped by a bunch of neo-Nazi farmers in Ukraine, as he perceives Ukrainians to be, of course. Uh, and, and he's trying to step up the rhetoric to say, no, this is actually a very serious conflict. We are in war against the West. We're in, go in war against NATO uh, to, to try to um, partly sell it to his uh, own contingent, to his own population in Russia, and partly to signal that this is not just a little war to him. This is uh, this is his effort, and he is a real uh, threat to to the West. Um, and uh, thankfully, China has been solidifying their position. You remember a few days ago, uh, th there was news about Russia, Russia re uh, requesting help, uh, military, military, economic, and even food from from China. And then China was sort of flaky in their messaging. First, they said uh, no nothing like that happened, and then they said we'll never attack Ukraine, and then they said um, uh, they. Uh, Express some limited readiness to help Russia, but but now it looks it looks like it has been put to rest. Uh, China had said it's uh, it, it respects the sovereignty of Ukraine. It congratulated our government on uh, unsuccessful uh, uh, successful uh, resistance to Russian army. So it looks like China is not a threat. Huge relief because China China could be a, a big problem. So this is what's happening. Let's see uh, as Russia is trying to prepare for the second stage um, of their warfare. As you know, Wall Street Journal had reported uh, what what actually happens because a lot of these moves seem weak as hell to me. Uh, to be honest, you know, throwing children or fighters from Lebanon into into the mix that that's not going to make a difference. Uh, we'll see what happens with Belarus and see what kind of diplomatic slash political geopolitical ways he's he's going to try to uh, use to um, to occupy Ukraine. Uh, hopefully nothing that like that will happen. We have all the confidence in our government and our, our President Zelensky. I actually liked uh, Bill Maher's joke uh, about it. He's, uh, I'm sure you've uh, seen it. He's like, uh, finally, we have a president who everybody likes, very high approval rating. Of course, of course he's the president of Ukraine. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, I, I get the joke and and, and it's good, but uh, it does it does really help that we can uh, we can have a relative 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 confidence that our president is not going to just capitulate and and let Russia have their way. Uh, and uh, we we definitely thank the West today. European Union had accepted the fifth uh, package of sanctions against Russia. We were hoping they would. Uh, they would um, also approve a total embargo on oil and gas from Russia into uh, into uh, European Union, but of course, uh, hosted Bulgaria. Um, oh no, Hungary. Hungary said no. We were never going to support this sanction. Uh, there's something going on with with Hungary, uh, but uh, we're also seeing a positive uh, development in this matter because Germany had been meeting with uh, the uh, reps from Saudi Arabia Arabia about extending their energy collaboration with them. So we're seeing that uh, Germany is trying to make themselves more and more independent from uh, Russia's energy. So all of that is good. Uh, friends, I thank you very much for your for your feedback and for your active uh, position. I'm seeing a lot of you have added me as a friend. I'm seeing your posts and it's really encouraging to, to see how many people do uh, sympathize and, and uh, support Ukraine. Hopefully this will end soon by uh, by what our spokesman for the defense is saying, Aristovich, the active phase will stop in two, three weeks, which will turn into small time positional warfare. And if nothing major happens like Belarus attacks or anything like that, we could uh, we could start talking about long term and, and what this will uh, do to Russia and how it will help Ukraine develop. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye.